actually again. This is the panel on the sad topic of divorce. So if anyone here is not interested in divorce, you should leave now. <laughs> I don't know why I was picked to chair this panel. I didn't think anybody knew that uh, when I was very young, I, was, uh, I got married and divorced. I've been happily married for 35 years and I have nine children, but uh, there is that, that stain on my history. Um, so without further ado, our first speaker is Beverly Willett, who is the columnist and co-founder for the Coalition for Divorce Reform. So please join me in welcoming Beverly. that the most important problem facing our nation is family breakdown. And we know, beyond a doubt, that it is tied to so many social, so, social economic ills. In my view, the number one thing that has fueled that breakdown for decades is our nationwide system of no-fault divorce. Now, I was going to make an assumption that most people here in the Congress haven't gone through divorce, and maybe besides Steve, that still holds true. <laughs> but I think that um, means that the married people here who are, who are um, still married to their first spouse have children, and many of them have grandchildren that I've spoken with here. And what you probably already know is that those people, and you, and their child, your children and grandchildren are incredibly blessed, and you're becoming a minority. You and your subsequent generations are far more likely to have stable marriages and to be fairly well protected and better off than tens of millions of other people when it comes to finances, education, physical ailments, and your emotional life. The legacy that you leave has and continues, however, to be denied unlawfully to tens of millions of children, men, and women who have become statistics of broken homes over the last 45 years. And who are these children, men and women? They are your neighbors. But I want to tell you a story about one of your neighbors, and if you can just forget own life for a moment, and if you can exchange yourself with the life of one of your neighbors, and just, just consider this. You've been married for 20 years. You have two children. You have a nice home and you have worked all your, your life very hard to get through college, to plan for retirement. You don't come from privilege and you don't come from money. And you're not perfect because who is? But you consider yourself a good person, a good neighbor. You are a faithful spouse and you give back to others in your community. You have, have had many hard times in your marriage because again, who hasn't? but you've been able to work through those difficulties. One morning, you're sitting at your kitchen table, and you discover that your spouse is having an affair with a woman at work who's been married twice already. The next thing that you discover is that your, house is, your spouse is moving out of your home. And this all takes place a few days before Christmas. And you try and get through the holidays for the sake of your children and pretend that everything is okay. You decorate the tree. You make the, the food that you always make. You watch White Christmas like you always do. And you attend evening um, mass at your church, again, as you always do. That afternoon, you've worked many years as an attorney, and you, you've traveled, and you've juggled family, and everything that that means, but you've become a stay-at-home mom. Yeah. And one afternoon on the fax machine, these papers roll out and you read them and they're from your spouse's attorney and you're told to, you better get back to work immediately. You lie down to sort of catch your breath and your 12-year-old runs up to your bedroom and says, Mom, what's wrong? You mention that the roof is leaking. Before you know it, 
these words escape your mouth, and now I've got it all to fix alone, as you're filled with self-loathing. Minutes later, your children call you downstairs where they've drawn you a bubble bath, and they put little Christmas cookies by the tub. And the children that you were supposed to be taking care of are now somehow taking care of you. You were told by many people that you need to keep your mouth shut about your spouse and the girlfriend, and especially in front of your children, because it's in their best interest if you keep quiet. You're also warned about something called parental alienation, which is bad-mouthing, supposedly, your spouse. And if you want to see your children at all, you better be careful what you say 24-7, and you begin to live your life in fear. Each week, you help your children pack their suitcases as they begin the next 10 years of living out of them until they go to college. They live in multiple residences, in two different homes, where the rules and values in those two homes are very, very different. Eventually, the entire family is in therapy. Your children are 7 and 12 when this begins. And you worry constantly whether this is the end of what has just begun, and that is their childhood. One day, the doorbell rings, and you're about to walk your daughter to college, I mean, to walk, your walk your daughter to school, and someone shoves papers at you, and you open the papers, and at the top, it's labeled Action for Divorce. It's filled with lies about you, your spouse wants to divorce you, get child support from you, split the assets, sell the home, and have you and your children move out. Through all of this, in a very, very short period of time, you have lost 40 pounds right before your children's eyes. And regularly at night when you go to sleep, the pills that your shrink has given you for depression, you hold in your hand and you look at them. And then you remember something else. You would go back to that scene where the children have drawn the bath for you and laid out the Christmas cookies. And you remember your seven-year-old wandering in as she, as she begins to read The Little House on the Prairie from the little Laura Engel series. And years before, you remember you and your husband taking turns to read The Little House series to your firstborn. And then after your second one was born, you started the whole series all over again with your little one. At times, you gather on her bed to read together the same passage, making all four of you cry. And then the four of you would huddle in a big group hug. United, it seemed like that little family out there alone on the prairie. And you hold those pills in your hands, and you remember the two precious children who were sleeping one floor below you who depend on you, and of course, put them back in your nightstand door. And these become the moments that you cling to, and the sacred threads that keep you going. Now imagine you've also been raised in family, where marriage and family mean more than anything to you, and the promises that you made are important and sacred to you. And one day you're going through a lot of your heirlooms, and you come across your grandfather's ceremony, he was a Southern Baptist minister, and he actually married you and your husband, and you find his words to you at the altar. And here's what he said. Truly then these words are most serious. Not knowing what is before you, you take each other for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health until death. And because these words involve such <coughs> solemn obligations, it is most fitting that you rest the security of your wedded life upon the great principle of self-sacrifice. Sacrifice is difficult and irksome, he continues. Only love can make it easy. We are willing to give in proportion as we love. You realize that sacrifice in your marriage and family hasn't always been easy. But you also know that love has never failed to direct you in the right path. And the choices that you've made to stay in your marriage instead of walking away have always been the right ones. 
Now people think, a lot of friends and other people think you're kind of nuts to still love your husband. Because how is it possible to continue to love someone who isn't at that moment loving you back? The light bulb goes off, you've been a lawyer in your, one of your past lives. You don't know about the harm to children of divorce, and indeed much of the academic research is still to come out. But you know in the deepest part of your soul that divorce will leave irreparable scars on you and your children. And so you decide to fight for your marriage in court, in the justice <coughs> system. And thus begins the next five to six years of your life. Your first judge tells you to stop being stubborn and subtle, or she'll make all the decisions about you and your children and your future. You're told to get back to work and to let your spouse and your girlfriend get on with their lives. You were grilled on the witness stand like you're a criminal, and you're asked what you do all day as a stay-at-home mother. Your last judge tells you that what you really need to do is to sell your home, buy a condo, and get yourself a boyfriend. Mm -hmm. And to settle on your husband's terms or it's going to be a lot worse for you. There are no words of admonishment to your husband. You don't want a divorce. You've done nothing wrong. But you were di divorced eventually anyway against your will. Your property is divided. You don't see your children as much as you should have as they grow up. You're handed lots of bills. Child support is imputed to you. And your only crime is that you stood up for your marriage and your family, and you tried to save it. Now by now, you have figured out that this is a true story. Um, this is my story, and it's a tiny sliver actually of my story. I am and I will always be a victim of divorce. It is part of my DNA. And it's a family legacy that I did not choose, that I have been forced to leave to my children and my grandchildren. Now luckily, I am also a survivor of divorce. I am more than that. I have the good fortune to have good education and a law background. I have the good fortune to have started out with a little bit of money so that I had a little bit left out, left over. When all of this happened, I was in New York. And New York had not yet adopted no-fault divorce. It adopted no-fault divorce the very year after my divorce was final. But legally, I was allowed to contest my divorce. However, what I did not know is that by then, New York had become a de facto no-fault divorce state anyway. Somewhere along the line, I realized that my story was not unique. Many people contacted me to share their own stories, and I began reading about stories of other people. I didn't know the word divorce reform, but eventually I co-founded a volunteer organization called the Coalition for Divorce Reform to work to educate people about the harm of divorce and to work for legislative reform. And now I call myself an abolitionist. The policy of our um, volunteer organization is to start small because politically it's just not feasible to get rid of no-fault divorce. But ultimately I believe that we do need to get rid of no-fault divorce in our country. And that is my mission. We have been living under this system for the last four and a half decades. Forty-five million couples approximately have been divorced. And that is, that is approximately 45 million minor children. This is the system that exists in all 50 states in our country. And I can tell you that of all of these divorces, even though I don't have the exact statistics, I can guarantee you that the lion's share of these divorces have been between a man and a woman, and that most of these men and women are, are heterosexual. Now, under this system of no-fault divorce, let me just tell you how it works just real quick. In most jurisdictions, one spouse swears that the marriage is irrevocably or irretrievably broken down, and often this spouse is the wrongdoer in the marriage. This sworn statement becomes incontestable, and the other spouse has no right to a hearing on it or to object. 
On this basis alone, the most important contract in our society is severed. All the couple's property is divided, and the children are divided up like cattle. You know, we're very, very big on choice in America. I just hear that word choice so often in America. And there's been some research on this, not a lot, but there's been some research on this, which indicates that as many as 80% of these couples, the divorce is unilateral. That means one spouse does not want the divorce. Now, you multiply that times 45 years and 45 million couples. And that's a lot of people with no choice. And the other thing that I can tell you is that of those 45 children, it's even worse because they have no choice whatsoever. 100% of our minor children have no choice about their legacy and their future. Now, I believe in protecting abusive marriages. I believe in maintaining protections for domestic violence victims and for, for uh, marriages that are highly abusive. But those are the minority of the unions in our country. And the results of no-fault divorce to children, women, and men have been negative across the board. On every indicator of well-being, divorce is costly to the American public. Taxpayers spend over $112 billion annually on fallout from divorce. And family court is a misnomer. It has little to do with protecting families. It has become a multi-billion dollar family dissolution machine built on the illusion of protecting the best interest of our children. One little point of good news is that we pretty much know beyond doubt that marriage matters and that it protects spouses and it protects children. We also know that most of these divorces involve low conflict marriages with very good chances of reconciliation. And we know that many of these couples actually want help, or at least one spouse does. But none of that is given by our courts. Now I want to give you some really bad news, and I think it's the worst possible news that you can hear. And that's that really nobody cares about these abandoned spouses and children. We do research about them. We even give speeches about them. People hear about them in the news. But nobody really cares. They've really been forgotten in our culture. If they speak up in court, they will be punished financially. If they speak up to their friends or in the press, they will be call, called out as nuts, as vindictive, as mentally ill, and in need of therapy. And how do I know? that nobody really cares whether you're on the right or the left, where you fall on the spectrum? Because is there any legal defense fund to help these families fight their marriages in court? Is there any one of our groups in society, is it on the political agenda of any of these groups to fight no-fault divorce? And is any but money being spent toward it? The answer to all of those questions is no. These few brave men and women and moms and dads are pretty much going it alone in court. They are putting their lives and their livelihoods on the line and being hung out to dry. And not even our churches really care too much about anything about them either. You know about the Pope's um, visit to the United States and the big conference that was in Philadelphia a few weeks ago. I was asked by someone um, very high up putting the agenda together, if I would come and speak along with another very big speaker here at your conference. And at the last minute, this person couldn't do anything about it, but we were nixed from the program. Instead, another very well-known opponent of divorce reform was one of the speakers in Philadelphia. And there was another session about helping the divorced heal because, and to quote, sometimes divorce just happens. <laughs> That's the answer from the Catholic Church. These millions of men, women, and children, again, I remind you, they are our neighbors. 
and I believe that we're morally and spiritually obligated to help them, only we're not. Now, we have money and time and passion for almost every single other issue in our culture, and I've heard about many of them here at this conference. And I'm not saying that many of these issues aren't important. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm asking if we have our priorities straight when it comes to marriage. Now, I don't usually talk, or I actually should say never talk about God, <laughs> when I talk about divorce reform, because I don't believe it is a religious issue. Certainly, it is a religious issue for those who are guided by their religion and their spiritual beliefs. But I believe that everyone's marriage is entitled to protection, whether you're religious, or Christian, or not. So I don't speak that way, and I've been trying to form a bipartisan coalition of people on the left and the right. But I think that I'm in good company, perhaps, to speak about, or at least to mention God today. And my mother, who I wouldn't have quoted 20 years ago, I'm starting as I'm getting older to remember a lot of things <laughs> that she has said, and they're starting to come back to me and come out of my mouth, and I'm starting to quote her. And one of the things that I constantly rolled my eyes at growing up, she said, God works in mysterious ways. Sorry. And if that's true, then I think sometimes we don't really know what God's plan is. One of the hardest things that I've had to accept is that maybe I had to lose my marriage and my family in order to, to speak on behalf of others. I haven't always been happy about that plan for my life. I just got back from a, a silent retreat and I went there for answers in my life. And I came back with more questions. But the one thing that I understood from that retreat was that God is a lot bigger, and his ways are sometimes a lot more complicated than I ever thought. Now again, I can't speak for him. But I just want you to consider this. I want you to think about the Supreme Court's decision legalizing same-sex marriage. And I want you to consider whether that could possibly be a gift. And if so, are you brave enough to use the gift? Now, I was a lawyer for many years. I don't practice anymore. But it has always been clear to me from the get-go that no-fault divorce is unconstitutional, that it is a huge violation of due process. And I believe that the Supreme Court's opinion in Obergefell gives us powerful ammunition to abolish it. To abolish, With Ober to abolish it. With Obergefell, the Supreme Court has bestowed the highest level of constitutional protection on marriage. And I believe its pronouncement leaves no doubt that no fault divorce is unconstitutional. Marriage is an act of self-definition that shapes a person's very identity, the court held. It is a keystone of our social order that is essential, and I'm quoting, to our most profound hopes and aspirations. And yet if marriage rises from our deepest human needs to the level of being essential, how can state-sanctioned unilateral divorce laws strip that away? How can it allow one spouse to choose for both? The Supreme Court further said that marriage safeguards children and gives them the stability and permanency necessary for their best interest. And that marriage also carries with it thousands of state and federal benefits. No-fault divorce strips all of that away with their compensation without a hearing, and in the absence of absolutely any legal wrong. In conclusion, the court said that, found that locking gays and lesbian out of marriage demeaned them. But is it less demeaning to have the state side with the spouse you pledged lifelong fidelity to? Divorce your family? 
divide your property over your objection and stamp its blessing on the carnage. How can this not violate due process? How can it pass muster under equal protection? No fault certainly places spouses on just and unequal footing in the courtroom. Doesn't it then, to quote the court, violate central precepts of equality, therefore also violating the equal protection laws? Now here's what puzzles me. You know, those advocating on behalf of same-sex marriage, I wonder why they have fought so hard for what has been essentially rendered meaningless in our society by no-fault divorce. And I wonder for those who have fought so hard to abolish same-sex marriage, why have they for so long ignored doing anything about the consequences of no-fault divorce on heterosexual couples and their families, participated in their own serial marriages, and left those trying to save their marriages alone to fend for themselves? If we truly care about restoring the country's faith in marriage, I believe that we will put abolishing no-fault divorce at the top of our national marriage agenda. Laws are a reflection of our values. And under the current scenario of no-fault divorce, our divorce laws tell us and our children that we don't bear it, that we don't value marriage very much. Although marriage is the most important contract in our culture, it is the least protected. And we in America have allowed no-fault divorce to reduce it to rubble. I'm going to leave you with a quote. Pulitzer Prize winning poet, who's probably the most famous and most well-read poet still living in America today, Mary Oliver, said this in her poem entitled, What I Have Learned So Far. She asked this question. Can one be passionate about the just, the ideal, the sublime, and the holy, and commit no labor to its cause? And then she answered, I don't think so. All kindness begins with the sown seed, she said. The gospel of light is the crossroads of indolence or action, and therefore be ignited or be gone. Thank you. Thank you, Beverly. Every divorce is the death of a small civilization, but it's very difficult to hear about that death step by step, up close and personal. So, thank you again. I know it's difficult to share, but it's been helpful for all of us to understand the personal pain. And what can be done about it? I, I never imagined that we would see anything positive in the recent Supreme Court decision. But I see your point. And now I'd like to introduce Michael McManus, who's the head of Mary's State. I want to defer now, to my colleague here. Now, once again, there's been a revolt, and they have changed the economy. <laughs> All right. And Tamara Dacril, who is an attorney at law and a master mediator, is going to be speaking next. And then, Michael, are you after her? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Christelle. Please join me in welcoming uh, Tamara. All right, I'm just going to get hooked up here. Hopefully, it will work like we think it should. Okay. an attorney and a master mediator and I also have a PhD in marriage family human development and as an attorney I spent the last 18 years working with thousands of couples helping them at the crossroads of divorce and also divorce so I chose to get my PhD so I could help a little bit more on the preventative end with things and so I'm going to go through this is a guidebook that um, I helped write when when obtaining my PhD my PhD took six years to get 
and um, it's basically it's on Amazon and we sell it for the cost of printing only and basically it's a guidebook for individuals who are thinking about divorce um, as, as at the crossroads it gives uh, hundreds and hundreds of statistics and all of the data um, that's gathered regarding divorce, children of divorce, and tries to encourage people to, to work it out. Um, but it also has a section that I've helped with that if you have to proceed with divorce, what the road would be. And so many of you, all, most of us know that 40 to 45 percent of first marriages end in divorce. When you go into second marriages, 60 to 65 percent end. In divorce and so but some people are surprised to know that the divorce rate has decreased since the 1980s we have a lot of talk about the divorce rate increasing but however there has been an, a decrease although we understand that because of cohabitation we've got a lot of uncounted divorces and also I just wanted to note that the studies show that the divorce rate is increasing for the less educated couples people that just have high school degrees they're, they're on the rise as far as divorce is concerned. Um, but there are factors that reduce the risk of divorce. Uh, these factors are aggregate, but if your annual income is over $50,000, it reduces your risk of divorce by 30%. If you have a child seven months or more after marriage, it reduces your risk. Marrying over the age of 25. Um, families that come from origin intact, so their, their parents are married versus divorce, um, religious affiliation versus no religious affiliation, college versus high school dropout. And once you aggregate these, your divorce, your risk of divorce can go down to below 10%. And so you'll note that there's certain risk factors that make um, divorce happen. Here's a, just some interesting, um, it's a variety of studies, some interesting facts. 72% um, of unhappily married spouses are married to who? Happily married spouses. Happily married spouses. It's an interesting thing because there's not a lot of communication that goes across between people. And so it, I think it's interesting to note. So then we've got the other small percentage of unhappy married to unhappy. And so, um, so that's an interesting statistic. Um, just as a side note, women tend to be more unhappy in their marriage than men. And women tend to be the people that are more likely to initiate divorces than men. 50% um, of married individuals have thought about divorce. Now this is a new study that literally came out very, free. I got it yesterday and it hasn't been published yet, but Alan Hawkins gave it to me, I've got a copy in my binder. Um, what they did was a divorce ideation, and so people that are thinking of divorce, they did a national sample, 3,000 people involved, so this is America-based. 50% of married individuals have thoughts about divorce. But these people stuck it out. They stuck in their marriage, and they found that patience, changed attitude, and commitment were the most common techniques to resolving the issues. 94% of married persons who had troubles but stayed married are glad that they stuck it out. And that's um, a, a Minnesota data set. And then 75% uh, of people that actually divorced, one year later, at least one spouse was having second thoughts. So you can see um, that there's a lot of ambiguity and regret that can happen with the divorce process. Um, so what happens to people in unhappy marriages? That's the question that I'm posing. There was a study done here, and you can see at the bottom, 10% rated their marriage unhappy or very unhappy. And so the question is, well, what happens to these people if they stay married? Five years later, uh, what happened is 19% of the sample divorced, but 81% of that sample stayed married. And five years later, 77% of the very unhappy people became quiet or very happy. This shows us that marriage in itself can be a vehicle for happiness. If you also compare the people in this study that um, divorced and other studies, only 10% of them reached happiness. The rest of them either got worse or maintain the same that they were at at the level of their divorce. And so you can see that a lot of times the divorce pathway is not something that creates happiness in itself. So if someone tells you I'm divorcing to, be, to become happy, you can educate them that marriage is the vehicle that is more likely to create that happiness. Um, uh -huh. Bill Doherty is a colleague that I've worked with uh, a lot and he has um, a study in Minnesota and he's doing some great work there. 
he surveyed individuals going through a divorcing parents class. And those of you that aren't familiar with the laws, the divorcing parent class is something that you go to right before usually the divorce is final. So it's kind of the last steps of divorce. At least it's that way in Utah. So he surveyed these, these individuals that are like at the last steps of, of divorce. Guess what he found? 30% of individuals, even in that last phase, hoped that their marriage could still be saved. And this is very interesting that 10% of couples, both husband and wife, they, so married people, they didn't know it because this was a, a sample that, but they matched the certain things in the data set. 10% of a husband and a wife in the same marriage hoped at this late stage in the divorce process that their marriage could be saved. And so Bill Doherty has revolutionized a program out of Minnesota at the very last stages to help people reconcile. Even at the very last stages, right before divorces are final, they're doing a last ditch, ditch reconciliation. And it's really great and exciting things that are happening there. And so here's six catalysts that cause divorce. Through our firm, we have eight attorneys that work for our, our firm, and we all mediate. We do over 1,500 cases a year of divorce through our firm. Um, addictions to alcohol, drugs, pornography are very common in divorces. So high morals is something that when we talk about teaching our children how to have good marriages, having high moral integrity, honesty, avoiding things like pornography and drugs and excessive alcohol, that's something that can teach them. Also, fidelity in marriage, sexual addiction of adultery is very common. Um, also, it might be a little more surprising to some people that addiction to spending that cause financial issues inside the marriage cause divorce, as well as anger management issues. So conflict resolution to children when they're young is very, very important. A lot of, it's interesting to note that of these cases with, with um, some type of anger management or abuse issues, the studies show that only about 8% of those are the serial kind. The other part, people and parties can be educated and can go to classes and the marriage in itself can cure itself. And so, um, th so even people with extreme um, cases can still go through and heal their marriages. But in, in general, serious issues with abuse and addiction are best help, the marriage is best help with the aid of professionals. And divorce is the way to help marriages set the moral boundaries for those people that don't want to have to live with such addictions. Um, here's a study that shows that um, when people are telling why they divorce, that most of the reasons for divorce are what we call soft. Um, lack of commitment, too much arguing. Now this infidelity, it's something that we do at our office. Sometimes people will say, you know, he cheated on me. But then when you ask him, he's like, I didn't, I swear. And we know that some of those people are lying, but some of them are probably telling the truth. So there is some suspected infidelity that may not actually occur. So that's why there's always an asterisk by that 55%. Marrying too young, unrealistic expectations, lack of equality. These are all soft reasons for divorce, that education, commitment, changed attitudes, perseverance, all of those things can help these divorces. So I'm going to talk about, um, in the last part of my talk, three common high-risk patterns that we see, um, that I see as a practitioner of divorce that, co that cause divorce. The first is the demander and the avoider. There's six conflict styles, and demand is on one set of the spectrum, and avoid is all the way on the other set of the spectrum. Demanders are assertive people that like frank, quick-paced conversation and like to get their way. They enjoy the debate. You guys know this person, right? Mm -hmm. Does anybody have this person in mind? Just the quick-paced, I love debating type of guy. Now, let's just say they marry Miss avoider who cannot express her thoughts or opinions when she's upset with someone and she is extremely conflict averse. These two people marrying one another create ineffective patterns but they're patterns that can be cured through bridges. So the patterns develop in the marriage that enable bad behavior on both sides for the demander and also for the avoider. Avoiders tend to say yes to everything that a spouse asks for, even in their mind when they want to say no, even when they want to set boundaries. But what would the demander appreciate? Them saying no, setting the boundary. They're just waiting for it to occur, but the avoider never does so. So there's not proper boundaries inside of the, the, um, the marriage. And it's always surprising to the avoider that the demander would divorce them. 
because they literally have accommodated their whole life around this person. But you know, the demander is waiting for the assertion. You know what? I don't, I hear some people say to me, I don't want to go one place one more time where my wife says to me, when I say, where do you want to go? And she says, I don't I care. Don't care. <laughs> where do you want to go? They want their spouses to have opinions. They want to assert for themselves. And not only that, they want to know how to take care of their spouse. But the avoider spouse will not let them know what their needs are. So it's very difficult to accommodate those. In this, the, and I've spent a lifetime talking about these six conflict styles of which I'm mentioning too. But just note that the demander system is a deductive process. What that means is that they like solutions first, followed by short bullet points of why that solution is proper. Whereas the avoider process is completely inductive and it starts like once upon a time in the middle of the woods, there were three bears. And the demander's like, what's the point? What's the point of the story? And she's like, wait, there's a mama bear, a papa bear, and a bear. And the demander, what? What is it that you need? I'm not understanding. Are you getting to the point here? And so the way, the inductive way, the story form, the de deductive way, the bullet points, when you match those two together, it is very difficult unless you're educated. The 24-hour rule is something that is very helpful for both. Now, demanders tend to over-engage. They love conflict. They love the debate. They want to over-engage everything. And, but, and so we say with the 24-hour rules, if you're the demander, wait 24 hours before you engage because they soon forget about it. If things go in one ear and out the other, if it's still important in 24 hours, go ahead and engage. The avoider, just the opposite. They have a hard time bringing up the conflict. If it's still bothering you after 24 hours, it is time to engage. It is time to be brave. And how are you going to engage that demander? You're going to engage them by giving them the conclusion. When? First. First. Mm -hmm. Followed by supporting After bullet that. points. Yep. And bullet points are short. I think the best thing ever invented was text message for the avoider. Because you really <laughs> only have so much and you have to condense it down and you can and you can bullet it over to the person. Um, in general, when you think about the pattern of the demander and what the listening pattern is, think of this as the listening stick. How, how, who's in charge of the stick when a demander talks? The talker. So, come up for just a second. Sorry. I'm a demander. Oh, perfect. Okay, are you really? Oh, yeah. Oh, perfect. I love it. Okay. Okay, is your wife an avoider? Uh oh. No, she's kind of you, demanders. Well. Oh, perfect. Okay, demanders married to your demanders is a good fit, guys. So, who's going to take the stick when you're talking? Yeah, and you know what? You know what? I'm going to take it from you back, right? And then he's going to take it back, and I'm going to take it back. The, the back and forth is what the demander expects. Who's in charge of taking the stick? The talker. Now let's contrast that to the listener spectrum. Who's in charge of taking or taking or passing the stick? We don't take the stick when we're in the listening pattern. Da 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 da. I'm gonna tell my story from the beginning. A story has three parts: the beginning, the middle, and the end. And what does the listener expect? How is the sequencing gonna go? I tell first the beginning, middle, and then end. And when does the other person talk? At the end of the end. And that is not even possible for a demander. I mean, the end of the end never comes. And so what happens is the demander grabs the stick, and the avoider, we're not supposed to grab it because we pass it. And guess what? He'll never pass it back to you. Do you see why this is a problem? Do you see why these marriages need just a little bit of education? I am so tired of going to communication classes where they say, I want you to actively listen. I want you to say nothing. That is only the avoider process. What about the other process? Why can it not be respected that the less spectrum, the demanders, the convincers, the negotiators, they expect a back and forth. What did you do? I did, they tell the story intermittently. He's going to tell it as he goes, and I'm going to interlude, and we're going to keep going back and forth. Both processes should be respected. And so when you see these in marriage, it's so sad to me because education is something that can help them. Um, and so we're going to be frank and honest because why honesty is very important on the left spectrum. On the avoider side, respect and uh, being soft on the feelings is more important than being candid. Do you see? 
And so I'm not going to give you hard news for the most part because I respect my relationships so much. Um, you can always, if these are really extreme, first of all, you can marry someone on the left spectrum. Uh, demanders can marry convincers and negotiators, and those are great fits. But when you get this wide divide, and guess what? Avoiders can marry uh, team workers and supporters and avoiders, and that works. But when you get people so different on the spectrums, bridges are needed. And there's a lot of third parties that can help build bridges, therapists, coaches, um, and so people can use that. So establishing proper boundaries is important. And also for these types of people, being able to create a, a form to express concerns. For the avoider, they're just the backwards. You do not interrupt them. You do not, why do they talk to you? See, on the left, it's to get a solution. Why on the right? To share. To share and build a relationship <laughs> and connect. It's not about solution. So you don't want to give the solution. You don't want to say, you already told me that. Because on the right spectrum, they're likely to repeat things three and four times. We're going to be kind and soft. And remember that on the right spectrum, they're, ver they're thought processors. On the left, they're verbal processors. So what does a thought processor need? You think about it, then you engage. But if you don't get to think about it, you can't engage properly. You have to honor the fact that we need some space and time to think about what we say before we say it. So we think, we engage, and then this is the funniest part, then what happens? You go home and think about what you said, and then you have to re-engage. And the left spectrum's like, we already talked about this. <laughs> but you've got to honor the two-prong process on the right spectrum. So there's a lot of things that we can do in this regard to help people. Another, another uh, thought is on auditory and kinesthetic people. Auditory are people that process through hearing and listening. Kinesthetic is a person that processes through smell, touch, and movement. And the third, just for information, is the visual, um, who processes things through seeing. And so in effective patterns, think about this. The kinesthetic, you can tell kinesthetics because they always wiggle their leg when they're asked to sit still. So if you're a, a leg wiggler, you may be kinesthetic. Um, but kinesthetics tend to be overwhelmed by the auditory process, which is sitting down, staring at one another, and talking for long periods of time with no break. Kinesthetics have a very difficult time doing that, but that is what the auditory person needs. They need that undivided attention, eye to eye, with no other distractions. The kinesthetic, how do they like to talk? Through walking and moving and working and talk as you go, right? And so when you talk about building the bridge between these parties, it's very simple. The auditory, we're going to debrief and talk every day using family dinners. Besides the fact that there's great stats on family dinners, it's a good time for an auditory and a kinesthetic to work together because you're doing something, you know, you're eating. So the kinesthetic's fine because you've got that natural movement and the auditory can still do all the hearing. I'm um, using pillow top as another thing. Now an auditory person, are, are we going to text them? No, we got to leave the loving message that says, hello, I love you, you're so amazing. <laughs> and so leaving the message, talking voice to voice is more important for the auditory person. Were the kinesthetic, what would they prefer? Text, the touch and text, because I can go back to it whenever I want. And so the kinesthetics, you're going to allow and respect the time for activities, expect them to talk while they're doing things, and certainly do not overwhelm them with long auditory processes. So a conference like this for kinesthetics, you guys need a break. <laughs> just feel free to go ahead and take one. And then the last thing that we're going to talk about briefly is just this spender saver dynamic. And so it's an ineffective pattern. Why? Because savers need money in the bank to feel secure. Secure in their relationship, secure in their life. Spenders need to have something new to work towards to have a motiv motivation to life. So do you see how these two things can conflict? What most commonly happens is they separate financial accounts completely. And although I'm a fan of that in some ways, I think that the wisest thing to do is to also have a, a joint savings and spendings account where the couple, as a goal together, is unifying in saving, maybe through an IRA or mutual fund, and then spending and saying, hey, we're going to save up this much and then we're going to buy that 
X or Y, whatever it is. So that can be a healthy part of their marriage instead of just polarizing the parties. And then of course we can talk about paying off a, um, a debt with the snowball effect because debt in general is not healthy or good for marriages. And so that's something that we want to do. So just in general, I'd like to close by saying that the general tips for good marriages are what? Continued courting, that's going to include surprises. Surprises are a big thing, guys. Something that's not planned, a surprise. Um, weekly date, a yearly honeymoon, or connection. I know me and my husband, we meet quarterly. And here's my cute husband right here. We've been married for 21 years. And um, he's here to support me. So. Um, we meet quarterly. We, we do a list of 10 things that we love about their mari our marriage during that quarter, three, th three to five things we're going to work on, and then we check back the next quarter to see how we're doing. We write those goals down on our mirror to make sure that we're not forgetting them. Communication is important, and a lot of these things have talked about, well, how do I communicate? Let's give our spouse the, sim the system. And I, I couldn't be more happy with Evernote on our phone. My husband and I write secret love messages to each other that transfers via telephone and is safe forever in our Evernote app. Um, intimacy is always an important part of marriage. People will come to me for divorce, and when they're asked the question that sometimes come up, I have not been intimate with them for months or years. That's too long. It's too long. Um, commitment, staying committed to your core values, to yourself. And so I am asked about once a month, someone will call me, I'm thinking about divorce. You know what, it's okay. In the study that was just done, 25% of people are seriously thinking about divorce, but only 10% of those people actually move forward with it. It's okay to think about divorce. We're in a culture where divorce is all over the board. It doesn't mean you need to engage in that process. So what do I say? I say, fight for your marriage. And I get a little, emotional about it because I've had so many couples come to me and I know how hard it is to fight for your marriage and I know how hard it is to go through the process of divorce. I've helped thousands of people. I've influenced thousands, tens of thousands of kids and both of them can be extremely painful. But the reason that I say to fight for your marriage and try everything, move, get rid of your smartphone, try therapy, change your habits. And again, try again, even when you're divorcing, try again, why? Because a couple I told two months ago, try again, you know why? Because when you say I'm serious about divorce, it is a catalyst for change. Sometimes, even in the last of things, people will change. And so, remember, you can start the snowball fight, but once you throw the first snowball, you cannot end it. And once you tell your mom and your sisters and your friends that you're going to divorce, it becomes so large and so big that my friend that six weeks later decided I'm not going to divorce even though my husband has had several affairs. I'm going to try to work this out. And the sisters and the mom and the friends are like, you are crazy. And it's true. She was crazy, but she fought and she made it. And she had to kind of alienate her herself from those people that weren't supporting her in it. And so fighting for your marriage sometimes results in divorce, but you can have the comfort and you can look God in the eyes and you can look your children in the eyes and you can say, you know that I tried everything possible to save my marriage. And if this was the attitude of Americans and if this is what we taught ourselves, our children and other people, we would benefit, our children would benefit, our nation would benefit and our families would benefit. Thank you. I have something to ask you. Is there any way I can get your stuff? Your stuff is so good, I want to get copies. Can we, can yeah. we email it? Yes, I'm happy to email it to anyone that would like it. Okay. We'll have afterwards. After questions Perfect. Afterwards. Okay. Okay. okay, sorry. Moving right along. Did you just hear while I'm plugging in? Yes. It's too much stuff to write that question. <laughs> Okay, I think you'll have plenty of time. Everybody has 25 minutes and we've stayed on track so far. And we will have that will leave us about 10-15 uh, minutes for questions afterwards. And uh, this is Michael McManus, the head of Marriage Savers, who is now ready to begin his presentation. So please join me in welcoming Michael. Thank you. Thank you all for coming, and boy, it's a full house here. This is wonderful. 
My name is Mike McManus, and as you heard, and I am the president of a group called Marriage Savers. Our goal at Marriage Savers is to help couples do a better job preparing for a lifelong marriage, enriching existing ones, or saving the trouble ones. And we do this with a technique we call a mentor couple. We train couples who have good marriages that you can find in any church to come alongside another couple and be helpful. Now, <clears throat> you heard some data here that divorces uh, are coming down a little bit, and they were for a while. But notice that the number of divorces actually tripled between 1960 and 1979. <coughs> and they've come down a little bit, but, but in the recent years, they've bounced back up. So uh, this is a cause for concern. The, what is surprising, perhaps, is that the divorce rate varies widely by state. South Dakota's divorce rate is 38%. Tennessee is over 70%. Mississippi is over 80%. Uh, this is surprising. <clears throat> children of divorce are three times as likely as children from intact homes to have a baby out of wedlock to be expelled from school. They're five times as apt to live in poverty, six times more likely to commit suicide, and 12 times as likely to be incarcerated. This is based on a report from the Heritage Foundation. Michael Reagan, who's the son of Ronald Reagan, and you, as you heard today, Ronald Reagan was the governor of California when the first, who signed the first no-fault divorce law in 1969. Uh, Ronald Reagan told his son later it was the worst public decision he ever made. But at any rate, Michael Reagan grew up in a divorced home himself. And he put in, in one paragraph what divorce means to a kid that's far more impressive to me than all the statistics. Divorce is where two adults take everything that matters to a child the child's home, family, security, and sense of being loved and protected. And they smash it all up, leave it in ruins on the floor, and then walk out and leave the child to clean up the mess. It's on about page 46 of his book, Twice Adopted. Of course, adults are hugely affected by divorce. By divorce. And, and, and one area that Farrell mentioned is life. A divorced woman lives four years less than a married woman. A divorced man, ten years less. And children are divorced five years less. In Maryland, which is my home state, we had 22,700 divorces in uh, 2013. The average cost to the public for a divorce, <coughs> because it normally involves a child, uh, and that Therefore, that woman is eligible for Medicaid and food stamps and welfare and such, and it costs about $25,000 on average per divorce. So one year of divorces in Maryland added $567 million to our public costs. And if Maryland had South Dakota's divorce rate of 38% instead of its 54% rate, there would be about 8,000 fewer divorces saving about $200 million in the first year, $400 million in the second, because that, that, same, that amount goes on, $600 million in the third. It is worth trying to bring these numbers down. And we at Marriage Savers have created really two answers. One we call the community marriage policy. This is an agreement by 20 or 30 to up to 300 pastors in the city to certain reforms that are designed to help reduce the divorce rate of their own congregations to near zero. We've helped fashion these community marriage policies in uh, 230 cities with about 10,000 churches. And uh, we at Marriage Savers, that is really my wife and I, we used to have staff, we don't have staff now, just us, uh, will go to that community, congratulate the pastors on signing this community marriage covenant. We'll do it at 1 o'clock on a Friday afternoon so it gets press coverage. It makes the 5 o'clock news. I'm a newsman. I write a syndicated newspaper column, so I know something about news and how to get press coverage. And uh, then the training begins at 6.30 on Friday night and goes to 10 o'clock and then all day Saturday. It's 12 hours of training uh, in five different stages of uh, helping marriages. The key answer of, of the help, the key help that's available is a mentor couple. Every congregation has couples in healthy marriages. 
they have an untapped marital wisdom that could be helpful to other couples. But rarely does the pastor think of couples in his church as a resource to the marriages in his church. These couples in healthy marriages can be trained to become mentor couples to those who are preparing, enriching, or restoring marriages. And we, mentor couples, have some unconditional gifts to give. We have a love for others because we are so feel blessed by God with our own marriage. Most of us are in our 40s, 50s, or 60s. We have some time now. Our kids are up and out. And we have our own marriage to share. Trained mentor couples, and they have to be trained to do this, can virtually eliminate divorce in the local church. Pastors, listen to this. Would you like to eliminate divorce in your local church? Train a network of couples to help you do the marriages of your church. And we do this by creating interventions at five stages of the marital life, placing a safety net, in effect, under all the marriages by doing these five things. First, really thorough marriage preparation. Second, an annual event to strengthen all existing marriages. Third, training couples whose own marriages have nearly failed to mentor those in current crisis. Fourth, helping those couples where one person wants a divorce and the other one does not to reconcile. Fifth, helping those who are in a remarriage with children from a previous marriage to be successful. These marriages normally fail at a 70% rate. We can save 80% of them. So, some details about these interventions. Paul in his letter to the Thessalonians said, Test everything, hold on to the good, avoid every kind of evil. Uh, what couples are doing today to test the relationship is the cohabit. It's the worst possible thing you can do. My wife and I wrote a book on it called Living Together, Myths, Risks, and Answers. Last year, 7.9 million couples were cohabiting but only 1.4 million of them got married. Hello? What happened to the other 6.6 .6 or 6.5 million? Most of them divorced, or most of them broke up. There's an alternative, and that is to require any couples getting married in the city to take what's called a premarital inventory. This is a very detailed questionnaire uh, of 150 items. And the male and the female used to do this on pieces of paper. Now they go online, and the male answers the 150 items, and the female does. And the results are sent to the mentor couple, so that the mentor couple can talk through the issues that are unique to their relationship, the specific things that they themselves have mentioned. And uh, here are examples of uh, items on the inventory. Sometimes I wish my partner were more careful about spending money. When we're having a problem, my partner often refuses to talk about it. If the pastor administers this inventory, about 10% of couples will decide, whoops, this is not the right person for me. And studies show that those who break up an engagement after taking Prepare and Rich, which is the inventory we use, have the same scores as those who marry and later get divorced. So all the couples who break an engagement have avoided a bad marriage before it's begun. Now, uh, I want to talk about one other element of this. If you have mentor couples involved who are not the pastor, but the mentor couples are doing talking through the issues with the couples because the pastors simply don't have time to do it. We're talking about 150 issues after all. To do it properly, it takes six or seven evenings of two to three hours apiece to do it well. And one mentor couple can have two couples per year to work with. That's all. So you have to train a bunch of couples to do the work. But if you do that in our home church, we prepared 288 couples for marriage with our mentor couples that we trained in the 1990s. In that decade, 58 of them decided not to marry. Wow, see, that's not just 10%. That's 20% who decide not to marry, who are avoiding the bad marriage before it begins. But of those 230 couples who did marry in the 1990s, we only know of 17 divorces now in two decades. That's virtual marriage insurance. That's what you can give to the couples you're preparing for marriage if you do it right. Now, one other element of that preparation I want to talk about is chastity. One of the most impressive things about the Mormon church is the high percentage of couples who are chaste before they marry. You have to be chaste in order to get married in that temple. And uh, 
That is extraordinary. It is an example to the rest of the Christian churches in this country. You heard Pat Fagan say that if uh, a man and a woman who are married have only had each other as sexual partners, after five years, 97% of them are still married. That, that is testimony to the wisdom of the importance of God's rules. But what? But we live in a, in a culture where people are not playing by the rules, right? Harry and I personally have mentored 61 couples. Of the 61, only 10 were chased when they came to us. But of the 51 who were not chased, we had a program for them. I showed them this chart that you can see here. I said, look, notice the virgins have much lower divorce rates than those who are sexually active. The, the virgins are about two-thirds more likely to have a marriage last than go the distance. Now, you can't become a virgin again, but you can become chaste from now to the wedding. Here's an optional premarital sexual covenant. We want you to consider signing this. We will co-sign it. You will keep the only copy. We won't give it to the pastor. This is between us as mentors and couples. And uh, of the 51 couples who were sexually active, I want you to guess how many people signed it. How many couples signed it? Oh. Agreed to be chased from out of the wedding. What oh. percent? All of them. 20. All. Well, it's closer to all. 43 out of 51 signed it. And of the couples that Harry and I personally mentored, we only know of one divorce. Uh, so it is part of make, building that chastity into the marriage preparation process is a very important step in making marriage preparation really thorough. What's the next stage? If all marriages run down over time, and uh, uh, you have to have a way to help couples kind of rediscover one another. We recommend an annual retreat that can be done by the church for about 50 bucks. That's what it costs for a DVD set like 10 Great Dates. 10 Great Dates is the one I like the best because it's the most fun. <laughs> the pastor says in January, February, and March, for 10 Friday nights, we're going to have a date night on Friday night. But it begins at the church. You have to come here and watch a video for 15 minutes on something like resolving honest conflict, or becoming an encourager, uh, or building a creative love life. Now, the couples buy a paperback book that has a chapter on each of those subjects. Hopefully, they read the chapter that week. But even if they haven't read the chapter, they watch the 15-minute video, and then they go to the restaurant and order their food. And while they're waiting for the food to be delivered, they go to the back of the book, and there's date three with two pages perforated to pull out. One for her, one for him, with five questions on resolving honest conflict in your own marriage. So that focuses your attention on your own marriage. And this has, the uh, kids have to be picked up in 90 minutes. So you can, you know, church gets free babysitting. That's one of the perks of it. But you have to pick, so you have 90 minutes to talk through this issue. Now, women love it because it's putting issues on the table they want talked about. Men like it because it's a date with their wife, and the kids are being <coughs> taken care of for free. They're having fun with their wife. It's a fun way to do marriage enrichment. There's lots of other stuff available. For example, fireproof, love and respect, uh, a lot of these kind of things. Or you can go to a marriage encounter or family life weekend. But if you go to a marriage encounter, you're going to be at, have motel bills for two days. You're going to have to pay two or $300 to, for the registration fee. That's fine. We went to marriage encounter. It was a wonderful thing. I, I, I realized when I was on this weekend that I was a very poor communicator. I thought I was a great communicator. I'm, I'm a <laughs> syndicated columnist. I've been. I, she says, but you don't listen to me. <laughs> you don't ask me enough questions. And so I learned I had to redo my marriage with regard to listening. Now, this is a controversial statement. There are some things that are absolutely wonderful. But in general, pastors tend to send all couples in crisis to therapists, Christian counselors. And some of them are very good. But if the counselor helps the couples heal their marriage in three sessions, they're, they're not going to come back. The counselor makes his money every time you come back. And here's the study of 300 couples. Couples who receive marital counseling are substantially more likely to divorce than couples who forego this option. Wow. 
All forms of marital counseling are associated with a threefold increase in the likelihood of separation or divorce, according to a book called Covenant Marriage by the author, you can see that. Um, this is page 122. Uh, what's the answer? The answer is not counseling, but mentoring. An Episcopal priest in Jacksonville, Florida, some years ago, asked this question that any pastor could ask, or a bishop in the moment. <coughs> Uh, tradition. Are there any couples here whose marriages were once on the rocks but are now in a state of healing? I'd like to meet with you after the service and with my wife. And out of 180 people in church that day, 10 couples met with him. He was thrilled. He thought maybe one or two couples might show up. If you were 10 of them, he said, would you be willing to share your marriage? What was the problem in your marriage? What did you do or what did God do to help you heal your marriage? And of the ten couples, six said they would do it. They, they met weekly for a year. And uh, at first, it seemed impossible to have any consensus. I mean, one woman was in adultery for seven years. One man was a workaholic dentist who was trying to pay off his dental school debt by working at night as a dentist should do during the day. And his wife said, what kind of marriage is this? I never see you. And one was a bisexual who went to, on Friday nights to gay bars. Oh, boy. But all of them realized that first they had to make a new commitment to the Lord. Second, that they had to learn by scriptural standards, not by cultural standards. Love in scripture is always a decision, right? Love is patient, love is kind. That's an act of the will. It's not a feeling. Culture says love is a feeling. It's not a feeling. It's a decision. I learned that the problem was with myself. I learned what to change, how to change, and began to change with God's help. And we're still in the process, and I'm going to share what you found with others. Now, we at Marriage Savers, when we go out and train in, in mentor couples, we will train them how to use these 17 action statements that I've just given you five of, that all couples who have troubled marriages who heal them go through, and they will tell their story using these statements. And so it helps the other couple look through and understand what they can do now to heal their marriage. And, and you also match up similar backgrounds. The couple that survived adultery, you match up with a couple in crisis across adultery. Couple A can say, this is what we did to restore our trust. That's exactly what couple B needs to hear. And they don't need to go to three sessions, three or meet them more than three times to do this. This is not a complicated thing. It doesn't take a year of therapy. The six couples who did this work at St. David's Episcopal Church in Jacksonville over the next five years, worked with 40 troubled marriages and saved 38 of them. Yes. And they planted these, this, these strategies in other churches. And in the 16 churches, 234 couples whose marriages were in crisis met with 63 what I call back from the brink couples, and all but 22 were restored. That's a 91% success rate in the transplant. All right, what if the husband or wife says, I want a divorce and live? Other spouse does not. We heard in these presentations that four to five divorces are opposed by one person. Your data, you know, your feeling is this is commonplace. And uh, what can be done? How can the person who is being told I want I want a divorce? What can that person do? Well, a couple in California who had each had five failed who had had five failed marriages between them, she'd been divorced three times. He was divorced twice. They've been married 30 years, I might say. Married each other, and they invented a course they call Marriage 911 for this kind of case. So if, it, if, the, if the person comes into the pastor's office and says, my wife wants a divorce, what do I do? The pastor can reach around behind and get a workbook called Marriage 911. He says, I want you to complete this workbook, and here's a support partner handbook for your friend. I want you to ask a friend to meet with you for an hour a week, male friend, the, male, the support partner handbook lets him know what questions they ask you on week two, three, and four, and so on. And you only meet with him for an hour, but you've got to do a lot of work in this workbook. You look up a lot of scriptures, you have to read a chapter of Proverbs every day. The purpose of this course is to help you grow so much you attract your wife back. And it works in over half the cases. That's the major answer for that stage. Now what if there's a remarriage? I mentioned earlier that couples and step families divorce at a 70% rate. Why is this so? One of the kids said, well, I don't want a new mom. 
and they can make her life so miserable that you drive, they drive her out of it. Well, a United Methodist Church near Atlanta came up with an answer. They call the Step Family Support Group. And this is where couples with stepchildren go on every other Thursday night to, to hear a talk by one of the couples uh, about their marriage and what they did, what they've learned. And then they get mingled with the others. And so couples learn from others who've been successful in this kind of marriage to make it work. And, and uh, 16 years uh, of 400 step families that came for help, 325 saved their marriage. That's an 80% success rate. 70% failure rate, 80% success rate. We have these community marriage policies in 230 cities in most areas of the country. Noticeably missing here are the Mormon states. <laughs> <laughs> We're open to working with Mormons, but we haven't had anyone call us. All right? What are the results? An independent study was done of our work by the Institute for Research and Evaluation. And they said, on average, in our first 114 cities, signed between the years 1986 and 2000, on average, divorce rates came down 17.5% citywide. Because you had such an impact in the marriages of the, of the churches that were involved. Secondly, we have almost a tenth of our cities cut their divorce rates 48% or more. Cities like Yuma, Arizona, El Paso, Austin, Texas, Modesto, California. Uh, and notice there, El Paso cut its divorce rate 79.5%. So that's the biggest drop we've had anywhere. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. The Institute estimated that between 30,000 and 50,000 divorces were averted by our work in these 114 cities. Well, we've had 113 more years in the original cities, and we've had uh, twice as many cities now, not 114, but 230. So we've probably saved 100,000 marriages from divorce with basically a two-person staff. We can come to any of your cities and help you do this. Come back to El Paso. El Paso slashed this divorce rate 79%. The result was most kids in El Paso were brought up by married parents. Very few of them became delinquent. And for the past four years, El Paso has had America's lowest crime rate. Austin is the fourth safest city in the country. It's cut its divorce rate in half. In 2010, the city of 665,000 had only five murders. Washington, D.C., with 601,000 people, fewer people, had 132 murders. If you rebuild marriage in a city, you're going to rebuild the culture. So you have to think about not just your church or your husband, but think about the whole community because you can change the culture. In addition, the Institute found that cohabitation rates fell by one-third in our cities compared to similar cities with the same uh, demographics. And in some cities, our marriage rates rose. Not in all, but in some. Modesto, California doubled its number of marriages from 1,300 to 2,600 percent. In Evansville, Indiana, the marriages rose 13 percent in eight years while they actually, while the U.S. rate was coming down 31% in those years. So it's possible to be countercultural as a community. Diane Soli, who created an organization called Smart Marriages, and was formerly the associate director of the American Association of Marriage and Family Therapy, the number two person running therapist in the country, came to our press conference in 2004 at the National Press Club and we announced these results of the Institute for Research and Evaluation. She said, as therapy grew in power in the 60s to 80s, we, that is the therapist, took marriage away from congregations. Clergy knew that if a couple was having trouble, they should be referred out to the experts. This research, oh, over? You got one more minute. Oh my, okay. Here's my phone number if you want to contact me, 301-978-7105. America has the highest divorce rate in the world. Our, we're triple that at Britain or France, why? 
23% of Americans are divorced after five years, only 8% of British or French, because in Britain or France, if you want a divorce and your wife doesn't, you have to wait five years to get the divorce. <coughs> Six years in France. We have 25 states with a zero waiting period. So uh, those are the states that are, that are zero, and, but we have two states, Pennsylvania and Illinois, that have a, uh, a to require couples who's, where the divorce is contest, contested to wait two years for the, for the divorce. And the result is their divorce rates are half that of these hothead states with instant divorces. So the obvious answer is require uh, at least in a, in a year before a divorce is granted, two years of contested, and, uh, and if we do that, uh, we can reform no-fault divorce. There are other answers such as better education that Bill Doherty, for example, has one of his proposals is second chances out there in Minnesota, and it would require couples getting divorced to uh, <coughs> I'm walking over while I talk. <laughs> require couples getting divorced who have children to take a course on the impact of divorce on kids before they can file for divorce. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. speakers have much more to offer than they could share with us in 25 minutes, so I hope they'll st stick around afterwards to talk to them. Now, for our last panelist, Diane Urry. Diane, with her husband, pastors at Evangelical Methodist Church in North Carolina and focuses on young adult ministry. Please join me in welcoming Diane. I know your brains are probably hurting right now and you're exhausted and um, it's been a wonderful, wonderful week. Um, I'm really counting that my life has been changed. I'm going to think hard about a lot of things I've learned. I appreciate all that you've shared. I've learned a lot from each of you. Um, I've been married 31 years. Um, I have four grown children and two grandsons. And um, my best friend is your story shared. Um, it's hard for me not to cry thinking about her and uh, what she has gone through. Um, marriage is not easy and uh, mine is not easy, but we're hanging in there. It's just life um, together. I found out I was going to be sharing on this panel uh, this morning. So I did not come prepared with uh, something, but Janice Krause has my phone number in her cell phone, so uh, she texted me this morning and asked if I would share with you what I shared with the emerging leaders. I did a session on dating. Are any of you in here, were any of you in that session? Okay, good. <laughs> um, I shared on dating, and she just said, I think it would be good if you shared what you did so that people can think about things before they move into marriage. So that's what she asked me to do, so that's what I'm going to do with you. You know what's really good news? Um, I'm a pastor to young adults, so they're my heart and my passion, and my, all, all my children are young adults. Um, so I talk about this all the time with them, and I think about it a lot. But one of the most beautiful things to think about, in my perspective, is that in the Bible, I'm, I'm a Methodist. And so I'm speaking from um, traditional Orthodox Christianity, because that's my heart, it's who I am. I don't know anything else to talk about. Um, but one of the most beautiful things to me is that in the Bible, the philosophy of history, biblically, is nuptial. I love the word nuptial. It's rich. It's lovely. Um, but that's the, the philosophy of the Bible, is nuptial. The Bible began with a marriage. Jesus' very first miracle, contrary to the movie last night, his very first miracle was at a wedding. It's how he displayed his glory, the beauty and the wonder of who he was. And how does human history end? The marriage feast of the Lamb. The heart of God is for marriage. And I want to start with that perspective. And that is what's real. That's the fundament of our meta narrative that we live with him. That is the heart and the reality and the nature of who he is. And he shared that with us. He, the Bible reveals that his nature 
is <coughs> he's one person, he's one being in three persons. He's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He's eternally <coughs> personal. He's eternally relationship. He is community. He's eternally family. His very nature, before God was ever a sovereign king, he was a father. Before he was ever a savior, God was the son. And that's big, and that informs us who we are. He is holy love. He is more than just loving, he's holy love. And because of that, his very essence and nature is self-sacrificing, other-oriented, self-offering, and mutual. That's God in eternity before he ever created anything. He's oneness. He's union. And his all of his doing flows out of that beauty of who he is. His nature is always offering self. He's always self-offering. And he's always sending forth always for the good of the other. He always cares more about you than he cares about himself. Within the triune nature, the Son is deferential to the Father and the Spirit. The Father defers to the Son and the Spirit. They are other-oriented in his very nature. And so out of that, he created us. And we're created in his image. One image that is two distinct persons, male and female. And he took our clay, and he loved it, and he built beautiful human beings of this clay, and then he breathed his own breath into our nostrils. And it says in Genesis 2-7 that that's when we became fully human. We were fully human persons when God's breath, which in the Hebrew is the Spirit of God, came into our flesh, into our clay, and we became human. So to be truly human, our human personhood, that's one of the problems with our society, we don't even know what a person is. To be fully human, to be a real person, requires us to turn our faces to the face of God. He wants to breathe his life into us. And if we take our face, which is what Adam and Eve did, they said, um, we don't like your standards, we don't like who you are, we don't trust you, I, don't, I think you're holding out on us, this, this idea you have is not in my best interest. I don't trust you, and I'm going to do my life the way I think is best. And they turn their face from God. That's the literal Hebrew. Turn their face from God and became fallen and broken. And we inherited that. And if ever we to God say, we don't like your standards, we turn our face from him. You all might have kids. I have four of them that to me all the time from my little not rolling their eyes and turning their head to me. We do that to God. But when we do that, we don't have access to his breath. And we are depersonalized if we don't have access to his face. And that's and what happened is that our hearts, instead of bearing his image of other oriented, self sacrificing, self offering love, which Adam and Eve had, they became selves turned in on self. The definition of sin is a heart curved in on itself, rather than being other-oriented. And so if we're talking about dating, or planning for marriage, and in a marriage for 31 years, it doesn't matter. We have to think about that. How are we curved in on ourselves, or are we a real, fully human person? And God designed us to have a draw toward another person, and to create a union that brings satisfaction, <coughs> not pleasure, but satisfaction, much richer word. And he did that in order for us to become a living icon of who he is, so that the world would have a picture of the nature of God in a marriage. Two people loving each other sacrificially, mutually, where the other is more important than the self. And that'll work every day when you get up, at 7 o'clock in the morning, when you have to think, not about me, it's about him. No matter what, it's not about me, it's about him. 
So whatever our calling is, whatever we're doing, and I was talking to the young adults about dating. Our dating, our living, our being must flow out of that. That we are utterly dependent upon God. And then the number one rule for living with any kind of sanity or any kind of meaning in life at all is that my life does not belong to me. My life belongs to God. And that is fundamentally what the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. That's what that means. The awe of God is the beginning of understanding. So if we can say, my life is not mine, my life belongs to him, then that releases our tendency to want to control it and, and get everything we want our way. We don't get to make rules about marriage. We don't get to make rules about our sexuality. We don't get to be selfish because we have to yield to his design and his purposes. And when we turn our faces away from him, that's depersonalizing if you don't have any access to the person with a capital P. And that's, that's the foundation of our anthropology as human people. And those are the people, that's us when we're dating and when we're in our marriage. And we, if we don't keep ourselves clinging to the one who is by his very nature other-oriented and sacrificial love, then we are going to depersonalize other people. We will depersonalize the ones we date. We will depersonalize our husband. We can even depersonalize our children. And we don't want to do that. So we need to be clinging full-faced and yielding and surrendering to God. A lot of people just don't want to do that. They just don't want to. And um, that causes rifts. And I'm speaking from my own personal experience. If I'm ever not willing to do that and make excuses for why it's okay for me, I'm going to create static in my relationships with my husband and my children. Um, the great news is that Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, took on this clay. He took it on and he became us. He became one of us so that we could be the kind of human beings he always intended us to be. And so he became our clay. It's fascinating to me. It's mind-boggling to think the creator of the universe, the word who created all, became a zygote. <laughs> he became a zygote. He became an embryo. He was a fetus. He was an unplanned pregnancy. He went through everything it means to be human. And, and as he did that, he was recreating our humanity, recreating all over again so that we could live as human beings the way he always had intended us to be. And he, he even went through, I told the young adults, he even went through puberty as an adolescent boy. I have a son, and when he would talk to me, he, was, he and I are pretty close, and he shares pretty openly, and I would be going, oh, I don't want to hear him talk to your dad. <laughs> um, and I said, just, Jesus was a 15-year-old boy. You have a problem, talk to him, because he knows exactly how you feel. <laughs> and it's, it's that one who gave his life and killed our sin, killed our death, and resurrected again so that we can live in hope under any circumstances. He knows every trial, every temptation, every bit of suffering, every injustice we've ever endured. He, takes it into himself and bears it in his body, he's still incarnate. He's still a human. And he's fully God. And he's on the throne. And he's reigning over what it's like for us to be human. And we go to him with whatever we're in, whatever our hopelessness is, whatever our brokenness, whatever place we are in our marriage that looks impossible. There's no way this is going to work. Too hurtful, too painful. We go to him and he reigns in flesh as a human being and as fully God. He can handle whatever our life is going through. And when I talk about dating, marriage, anything in life, I start here and I do it without apology. Because 
If we are not living a surrendered, yielded life to this one who can provide, he's the only one who can pr provide access to being a, a lover of the other person, then we're going to hurt somebody. And we don't want, people have fragile, precious hearts in dating, <coughs> in marriage. My husband, no matter how angry he makes me, he is a precious, fragile heart. And if I am all about me, I can crush the life out of that man. I can slay him. And that is not something I want to do. I don't want to be a, a, a self curved in on self. And I don't care how many degrees you have. I don't care how much money you make. If you are not clinging face to face with the living God, you are depersonalized, and you're going to hurt somebody. And it's very important that we don't live for our own satisfaction, but live for the well-being of the others in our home. And I told this to the young adults, the emerging leaders. This is the basis, the fundament for dating. So we're very, very care careful about dating. Um, and we're careful in our marriages. I did find it interesting in your statistics about marrying young. Um, I think there's something, I've noticed many of my best friends marry very young. And they have beautiful, precious marriages. And whatever the age, what I love about marriage is that we come into an understanding of who we are in relationship to that person we're married to. People who marry young, um, they're still trying to figure out who they are. And they, they marry somebody and they, they're figuring out who they are in relationship to their life partner instead of um, having it all set and then they sure hope they can find somebody who gets their dream and can match their plan. <laughs> um, so I, I had encouraged my children to marry young if they could. I had one marry in the middle of college at 21 and one marry just a few months ago after she graduated from college. Um, there's something beautiful about binding together our lives um, and, and becoming who we are in the light of the other person. I'm so decisively who I am because of who I'm married to. That person has formed me. We disciple each other. That's why it's really critical that we choose well and we date well and, we, and we, we're, we're forming each other. And so um, this is one area I want to touch on before before our time is up, that has come to my mind as a pastor. I really appreciate it. I want to get your material for our church. I love your ideas. We are a, a, a we don't keep vows in our culture anymore. Vows don't mean much anymore. We're not a promise keeping group. They're just up for grabs. And um, I was reading Ephesians every day for a couple months this last spring. Just read the whole book every day. And it struck me in Ephesians 5, the chapter about marriage, we love to look at that chapter and relate it to our marriages. And it struck me very solidly one day that that's really, that's not, it's about the church. The, it's this, he's describing the nature of the church, and it's so beautiful and so wonderful that he has to use marriage to describe the nature of Jesus' love for his church. We are his bride. And this is a very intimate, beautiful reality that he self-sacrificially gave himself for his bride. And I wonder, you can think about this with me, this is just something I'm beginning to think about, but what about church? What about the way we handle church? Um, we have created a consumer mentality in American churches where um, worship has become entertainment, and we had better um, have something on Sunday morning that's cool and that I like, and if I don't like it, I'm going somewhere where I do like it. I really believe the entertainment thing has caused us to have a consumer mentality in our churches where we pick and choose what we, it's like going to a strip mall. Um, I like this, I don't like that, I like this, and then if something doesn't please me, I'll just leave and go down the road. After reading Ephesians several times, I began to think, I wonder, now think, you can think with me on this, I'm not sure, but I wonder 
if the way we view our ecclesiology, our view of the church, has not actually incited the level of divorce that we have in our culture. We have no commitment to the church, even, as the church. We leave any time we want to. We, we shack, shack up with the church. We don't join. We don't become <laughs> members. We just shack up, and we hook up with the church. We take what we want, and then we leave. There's not a consistent ownership and belonging. We break the vows of our membership. And I'm just curious how that's affected our view of marriage. Let's think about it. I'm going to end with um, just something that, I don't know, just something to, to think about as, as, we, as we close. Yahweh asked Abraham to leave everything familiar, his country, his people, his security. He asked Abraham to cleave to him and to follow him in complete trust. And Yahweh would be his provider and his sustenance unto the unknown. And Abraham just simply had to walk with God in faith. That's the foundation of covenantal living and in marriage. So in marriage, a man delights in a woman. He loves her deeply. And he wants to live his whole life entirely for her. She accepts his proposal. She leaves her family. She moves wherever he goes. She trusts her husband's passion for God. Very important, men, that you know that, that your face has turned hard toward Jesus and your, your wife lives in that. And, uh, and his protection, his provision, and his delight and his love for her will continue and grow with tenderness and knowing. She becomes his very home, his mirror, his source of strength, his nourishment from which he enters confidently into the world. And then she, she trusts him with all of her, her life. And then she becomes more bold in his world because of her love for him. It's a beautiful, self-offering, mutual, reciprocal love affair. And that's why marriage is so critical. And it's so important that we just view ourselves. We think we're, the promise begins with me, right? The promise begins with me. A vow is an, in, is an invitation to die to ourselves. That's what a vow is. And so if the promise begins with me, it doesn't begin with you. It begins with me. I die to myself so that our marriage can live, our families can live, and our culture can live. And I think that's the basis of it. Thanks.